Okay, so uh, we are starting our webinar for today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining uh, the seventh webinar of Gender Center for the Global South this afternoon. Uh, today we are uh, pleased to welcome our uh, special guest, Dr. Paramjit Singh. Uh, he is assistant professor of economics at Department of Economics, Punjab University, Chandigarh, uh, in India. Uh, Dr. Paramjit Singh holds a PhD in economics from Punjab University. Uh, he has eight years of teaching experience. He has many publications in uh, renewed uh, journal, journals. Uh, he is member of and coordinator at the Indian Political Economy Association and his area of interest uh, is political economy uh, uh, and macroeconomics. Uh, today, as you have seen in our uh, in our announcement for the invitation for this webinar, that he is going to share with us uh, his thoughts on uh, the topic of beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, gauging neoliberal uh, capitalism and new uh, unipolar world uh, order, which of course is uh, a, a very important topic to discuss, uh, especially under. Uh, the, the, this world the crisis that we are facing because of uh, uh, COVID-19 and um, all these uh, challenges that uh, the new liberal uh, capitalism world is facing. And uh, so uh, I will not speak too much. I will just, uh, we are all eager to listen to his talk. So uh, I, uh, I, will, uh, I will deliver to him now uh, the talk and at the end we'll have another discussion with him. So uh, please all welcome uh, Dr. Paramjit and uh, please pay attention to his talk. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, please write it in the chat box. And at the end, we are going to discuss all your questions. So you may start your talk, uh, Dr. Paramjit. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adam. And uh, I would like to thank Gender Center for Global South for inviting me to this uh, lecture. So basically, the topic that I would like to discuss is beyond COVID-19 pandemic. So the thesis that I would like to present is that I want to gauge three things. Basically, after COVID-19, what will happen to new liberal capitalism? This is one topic. The other is that is not much debated in contemporary political economy that what will happen to unipolar world order. So I will start that if you see history, then you will find that there were many pandemics that have affected the human life. So for instance, Black Death, it has killed around 200 million people, around 30 to 40 percent were Europeans. This is one pandemic that is recorded in the history, a very major pandemic. So it was originated in Central Asia. Then it traveled through Silk Route towards Europe. So second pandemic that world has witnessed, that was during the First World War, that is Spanish flu, it has killed 40 to 50 million people and 500 million people were directly affected by this. So World War I can be blamed for that because majority of the resources that can be used in order to better the life of masses was actually used to pay for war. So First World War itself has killed around 20 million people. And that was the man-made disaster. And out of which 9.7 were soldiers and 10 million were civilians. The other thing that we have witnessed in last century that was second world war it has killed 50 million people out of which 20 million were soldiers and 30 millions were civilians 
so if you see all these disasters whether pandemics or the wars there is one common thing common thing is that these were very much related to the history of capitalism these were product of globalization from first to the last and after second world war there were many pandemics so the fear which world had after second world war that was nuclear war and the other was ecological disaster so the point is that if you want to understand any issue instead of following the mainstream methods of understanding that is mainstream economics and politics which try to understand any phenomena in a isolated form by divorcing it from history by divorcing it from present and by divorcing it from related fields so contrary to that we will try to follow a horizontal thinking so my argument is that this pandemic and all the problems in this particular system in which we are living are very much related to the system so my point is that if you really want to understand all these things then horizontal method of thinking is relatively more important than the vertical method of thinking so in order in other words that if we really want to understand current health pandemic we cannot understand it by divorcing it from new liberal capitalism so in the light of these facts i will raise three points one is will current crisis led to end of new liberal capitalism this is my first argument second point is what will happen to us hegemony and unipolar world order after covid 19 third is if time allows we will try to gauge india in new world order so these are the three points that i will discuss so my first point is that if you see the history of capitalism then during the peak of industrial capitalism in europe frederick engels has wrote conditions of working class in england in 1844 in that work he has highlighted dialectics between economic and health consequences of capitalism so he argued that disease and desperate conditions of the masses are product of social relations of production under capitalism so disease and desperate conditions were very much interrelated to each other and historical experience shows that the societies driven by the capitalistic logic of accumulation whenever there is a crisis the victims are always marginalized and the common masses so therefore it is important for us to understand current pandemic in the light of accumulation logic of new liberal capitalism and its crisis so when we say new liberal capitalism it is not a very simple thing it represents an ideology this is a ideological alliance between three classes one is the corporate and financial elites the one class second class is their political elites third class is the intellectual architectures of new liberal policy so that i call sponsored intellectuals by the new liberal capitalism by the economic elites by the political bodies so if you see the ideology of new liberal policy it is ideology is to bring everything to the market in other words this ideology refers to the ideology of commodification 
and privatization of all these spheres of social life whether it's education whether it's health whether it's social security whether it's environment everything and if you see the intellectual architectures of this ideology there were two intellectual architectures one was milton friedman other was frederick hayek hayek has wrote the road to serfdom and fred friedman has wrote capitalism and freedom so both the books were representing a particular ideology that is the ideology of market that is the ideology to promote the privatization that was the ideology to promote the market driven social order so basically for the promoting this ideology both of them they got nobel prize in economics so they were the architectures of this ideology and since last 50 years or so this ideology has miserably failed to deliver its promises such as decent employment increase in real wage rate trickle down of wealth free movement of labor economic prosperity in global south it has miserably failed in all this so the outbreak of covid 19 is a nodal point that has exposed the wide spread failure of new liberal capitalism which rules on the behalf of masses without providing any service to the masses as norm chomsky has pointed out recently he was of the opinion that this pandemic was foreseen and could be prevented but the failure of public health system that has destroyed by the new liberalism and the rise of privatization of health system has resulted the miserable failure to control it so however if we see this crisis then the then the crisis of new liberalism was not resulted by this pandemic the crisis of new liberalism came onto the surface after 2008 financial crisis after 2008 financial crisis followed by wide spread inequality and recessionary tendencies in the world economy has brought capitalism as an economic system under severe criticism so this was first time in last 50 years after 1970 that capitalism as an economic system came under the criticism earlier the criticism was not of the system but it was the movements whatever type of movements were there they were isolated and they were allowed by the capitalism to criticize up to the extent that people should not brought system into the discussion but 2008 financial crisis followed by recession has brought capitalism as an economic system into the crisis so if you see the ideology of capitalism these three classes and their alliance they do not like that anybody should criticize capitalism as a system they do not like that so in order to avoid the criticism of the system they create false consciousness in the society so in 2011 the false consciousness that they have created that was a different sort of consciousness that in order to save the system and in justice created by the system they have sponsored 
authoritarian forces to grab the political bodies so the fundamental objective of new alliance between a new liberal capitalism and authoritarian political bodies was to tightly regulate the political sphere to the extent to tightly regulate the political sphere in order to deregulate the economic sphere up to the extent that economic elite has demanded so if you see the alliance of these three classes they always want to save capitalism and their basic thing is that they are ready to sponsor any type of forces which can save it and this time the experiment was to promote the authoritarian forces world over the rise of trump in united states rise of ultra nationalist forces in europe middle east even in asia so the outbreak of this pandemic it has occurred at a time when the world is already at a crossroads at this juncture juncture it has two implications one it can expand the control of authoritarian forces on every sphere of life the outbreak of covid 19 at this juncture the one implication of this juncture is that it can expand the control of authoritarian forces on every sphere of life which will dilute the idea of social and economic justice if you see the history of authoritarian forces then authoritarian forces grab the political power through ballot paper democracy during the weak days of capitalism you can see the rise of mussolini you can see the rise of hitler so they came into the power during the weak days of capitalism what once these forces capture the political power they always try to convert this power into absolute power at least in political and social spheres so this covid 19 has weakened the capitalism which was already in crisis and there is every possibility in the world that political and social sphere will be commanded over by the ultra right forces throughout the world this is one implication of this pandemic second is that this pandemic has exposed the real character of new liberal capitalism this pandemic along with economic and political epidemic can act as a departure point to relocate the functioning democracy so hence current health crisis it can also prove a nodal point from where quantitative accumulation of economic and political distress can lead to a qualitative transformation so however this positive sort of transformation for better future is subject to the condition that people should resist for that so social movement both global in global north as well as in global south should stand against injustice and a disaster produced by the new liberal capitalism the movement instead of being isolated movement for better health system should be multidimensional universal and organically fused if you really want to build a better future in post covid era so this is my first point that new liberal capitalism and its relation with the the crisis my second point is that something is going on in the world which is not much debated in mainstream geopolitical discussion that is 
the rise of china the rise of china after this health pandemic will result the shift in global power balance so the idea that us will remain the sole superpower due to hegemonic status of us dollar and due to it's a monopoly sort of situation or position in high tech technology this idea is vanishing throughout the world the power vacuum after the collapse of soviet union in 1991 will soon be filled by china future world order will be a bipolar world order the post covid world order will be a bipolar world order so one pole that was that we call imperialist and new liberal will be led by us and its allies the other pole of this bipolar world order that will be led by china and its allies so china's candidature to be global power it is quite strong and unique china's candidature candidature is strong and unique partly due to its historical tradition of looking inward partly due to its ideological commitment and partly due to its attitude towards outer world if we examine the recent history then we will find that china hasn't colonized any country china hasn't invaded like united states has invaded iraq afghanistan other and other countries during last 50 years china hasn't enter into the major war with any country at least in last 50 years china hasn't left its progressive tradition culture and values so these are some of the points which make china different from united states so in the last 40 years or so china's growing economic strength has undermined the already weak notion of fukuyama so fukuyama has wrote a very interesting article in 1989 during the collapse of soviet union the end of history if you go through the pages of that article then you will find the people who read marx the people who have some understanding of hegel they will find that fukuyama has developed a very vague notion right so he has vulgarized the idea of the absolute idea given by hegel he has vulgarized marx right so his notion was that the collapse of soviet union has established the dominance of western liberal democracy and capitalist economic system will only be the system that will rule all over the world and all the existing systems will fuse into it and china will no longer be an exception so his idea was that china will ultimately fall and they will follow the capitalist path of growth and they will follow the system of capitalism that is there in western europe and united states so however china has disproved the fukuyama's notion so if you see china's performance in last 40 years its performance was remarkable China is competing with United States in every sphere whether it's geopolitical whether it's economic whether it's ideological whether it's cultural so the intellectuals who favor China and China's socialism with market they consider China different from Soviet Union on the basis of three arguments one construction of integrated and sovereign modern industrial system this is one that china has second tuning of industrial production with the rural economy this is second third 
स्टेट मैनेज इंटीग्रेशन ऑफ चाइना विद वर्ल्ड इकोनॉमिक सिस्टम सो दीज आर थ्री यूनिक फीचर ऑफ चाइना सो इफ यू सी द इकोनॉमिक परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ चाइना देन इफ यू प्लॉट सिंपल जी डी पी डेटा देन इन परचेजिंग पावर टर्म्स इट हैज ऑलरेडी क्रॉस यूनाइटेड स्टेट इन एब्सुलूट टर्म्स ऑफ जी डी पी it is very much near to united states and it will pass united states in coming 5 7 years if you see the growth of per capita gdp in china during 30 years from 1980 to 2010 the growth rate of gdp in china on an average it was 9.3% no country in post world war history has recorded that sort of remarkable growth for such a long time so this is only china and if you go to second sort of indicators to check the candidature of china that is human development as amritya sen has pointed out many people at the global level has pointed out that in china there is a problem of human development but if you see the recent transformation of human development in china then those ideas are ideas of history in human development china is converging towards united states and it will enter into the category of high human developed country in in next 5 to 7 years so human development indicators are rapidly improving in china so that performance was appreciated by wto recently their performance was appreciated by united nation also right so the one indicator about human development in china is that during 1980 81 during 1981 850 million people were living below poverty line in china around 88% of its population in 2000 15 according to world bank data only 0.7% population is living below poverty line in china there is no country in the world that has reduced the poverty at such a remarkable rate this is other very important point about the strong candidature of china so the other thing that is very important about china which people are talking all over the world that china is trying to shift from quantitative growth towards qualitative improvement so if you read the report presented by jin ping in 2017 to the congress about the achievements and future prospects of china you will find the difference so what is said that in the next 5 year china will become a innovation hub of the world the economy in the next 5 year plan will be driven by the innovation led growth so they are going to shift from the manufacturing to the innovations and for that they wrote that they will attract 10000 leading innovative intellectuals and scientists all over the world to collaborate 10000 intellectuals from china with them to make china as a scientific and innovation hub so the fundamental difference between china us and western europe is that that is five year plans so five year plans if you read five year plans of china you will feel the difference so this covid 19 my point is that it is a nodal point from where china will get the recognition of other superpower in the world as us is moving towards inward looking policies china is till date looking towards outward looking policies so china have market china have potential to be a world power so this is my second case that after covid 19 we will see the second sort of change and china will rise third last point is that is what will happen to india so if you see 
Indian politicians, Indian economists, and policy designers. They are presenting India as a major architecture of new world order. So they may say that the future world order will be a multipolar world order because India is also rising. But real economists, instead of being idealist, should use power of reason to gauge India in a new world order. As I mentioned earlier, instead of being idealist, instead of following vertical reasoning, a real intellectual should follow horizontal reasoning to pass any judgment. Therefore, we should critically scrutinize India's performance in comparative manner to trace its position in a new world order. If we apply the power of reason, which is subject to critical scrutiny, you will find India is nowhere near to China. For instance, if we take the case of GDP, as I mentioned, the GDP growth rate in China from 1980 to 2010 was 9.3%. If you see whole independence history of India, there were only one or two years in India's independence history when India has touched 9%. And China has recorded 9% for 30 years. Second case, if you see manufacturing, that China is a manufacturing hub of the world, right? And India is trying to attract the manufacturing set. So you can find the difference in slogans. What is our slogan in India? Our slogan is make in India. What is China's slogan? Made in China. And this explains whole difference. So if you read that report which I mentioned, the Jinping report presented to the Congress and their plan, then you will find India is nowhere near to China. So China is going to be a future hub of scientific developments. On the other hand, in India, we are busy to blame minorities and our neighboring countries for our low GDP growth, for ineffectiveness to tackle the health pandemic in India. China is not blaming anybody. So the high in India, what is happening? That the hijack of major economic bodies, including planning commission, RBI, finance commissions, by the political bodies, is new normal in India. That political bodies has hijacked all the economic bodies. So political bodies think that they do not require the intelligentsia, they do not require the policy makers from abroad, they can formulate their own policies. And political bodies are powerful enough to take over the economic policies. So therefore, this is a serious challenge for Indian political bodies who are ruling over the economic policy to revive India's economy after this pandemic, because India was already in a very serious sort of situation prior to the pandemic, as far as growth and employment is concerned. The situation will become worse after this pandemic. So India has one argument. Being an Indian, we have one argument against China in order to hide our failure in all the spheres of life. That argument is that India has a valid paper democracy. However, current pandemic, if it prolongs, will take the political democracy to the edge of collapse in India. As far as current pandemic is concerned, India has made considerable efforts not to strengthen the public health system by pumping more money and ensuring 
provisions of required health equipments and the equipments for medical staff and doctors not through transfer of cash to the victims of pandemic and marginalized sections but through strengthening the command of repressive state oppressors on people so we are trying to tackle the pandemic in the, through this way in other words instead of using democratic means based on community level participation and responsiveness state preferred authoritarian means to tackle the current crisis so it has put a question mark on india's capacity not only to tackle the current health pandemic but more seriously the accumulated economic and political epidemic so india is a very precarious situation so my concluding points are one is that in new world order global health that was the issue of low politics after second world war it will occupy an important position in the politics this is one global health second is that that is deglobalization that was already on its way prior to prior to the outbreak of current pandemic it will accelerate further and if deglobalization accelerates then along with the deglobalization automation and robotization of the economy will accelerate and if it will happen it will seriously affect the working population who have lost their jobs my next point is next conclusion is the million of people who were sent by their employers temporarily to their homes many of them will not get a call back and they will go into an extreme poverty in the near future the next point is the new liberal capitalism and authoritarian alliance it will enter into the new phase that we can call an other new deal but this time the new deal will be different from the new deal that has took place after great depression that has promoted keynesianism and welfare state this new deal will strengthen the control of authoritarian forces on political and social life and economic sphere will remain open for the exploitation by the economic elites both corporate and financial so experience shows that intensity of crisis is synonymous with the intensity of egalitarian hopes so i would like to paraphrase a quote from marx and engel here let me paraphrase in context of current crisis and let me paraphrase in the age of current pandemic all fixed and frozen relations that is capitalist relations all new formed ones that is contemporary authoritarianism all that is solid that is globalization global value chains global supply chains global labor chains melts into the air with this pandemic all that is holy that is new liberal ideology is profane and men is at last compelled to face real conditions of his life and his relation with his kind so there are two dimensions of hope which are there in the age of pandemic and crisis one is there is a golden opportunity for china to prove itself to be a real for real follower of marxism as it has claimed in the history that they are marxist if they really want to prove 
then they should lend a helping hand to the third world countries particularly countries of global south to bring them out of crisis this can prove an effective way to challenge the new liberal solutions that is going to come out in the form of excess burden on common masses and we are witnessing that excess burden in the form of increase in taxes on the form of wage cut on the form of employment cut everywhere in the world second hope is it has widened the opportunities for those who want to reestablish the functioning democracy universal health and education decent employment environmental sustainability economic and social equality to join hand together against the non functioning democracy and new liberal authoritarian alliance but this time not in isolation and not through isolated struggle but in collective and common movement driven by organic unity of those who are victims of economic and political pandemic thank you thank you very much i am open for the questions and discussion thank you i think i have finished in time Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Faramji, for your uh, talk and presentation. Uh, so uh, I am asking, please, our uh, participant to write in the chat box their questions. Uh, I will start uh, by first commenting, and then I'm having my first question to you. So uh, we, as you have already explained, and uh, we know that we know that uh, COVID-19 pandemic. has initiated the global rethink of uh, of uh, the role of globalization and the foundation of a new liberal order uh, as it has exposed uh, uh, the inability of capitalism in safeguarding public interest uh, especially in uh, in healthcare requirements uh, socially vulnerable uh, class and uh, as you have already mentioned in the daily wagers and this uh, uh, category of poor people who are uh, suffering from their uh, basic needs they are not having the capability to earn their basic needs so um, speaking about china so as you have mentioned that china is having all uh, the main uh, factors needed to be the future uh, life leader of the world but uh, on the other hand you were also saying that uh, china uh, has has not uh, invaded any country or uh, colonized any country um, so china didn't use the hard power officially the hard power like european union like usa but don't you think that china is uh, using its soft power uh, in colonizing uh, african countries in uh, interfering in african countries politics and uh, uh, getting benefits from uh, their uh, uh, natural resources so we can say that uh, china is like new colonizing uh, africa and developing countries that are having uh, mutual uh, cooperation with china what do you think about this very much uh thank you very much for raising this interesting uh, issue that china is also trying to be colonialize in uh, africa in a new manner and not through very hard power as a soft power uh i agree with the point that you have raised that uh, china is uh, uh, expanding or exporting its capital to african countries and it's also trying to export capital to middle east 
and uh, to Iran also. And uh, the thing is that uh, when you are living in a global order and uh, you are trying to present your candidature to be a powerful country, then as far as my understanding is concerned, that if you see the history of many countries, then no country can become a developed country without export, exporting its capital to other countries. We have history of United States, we have history of whole Europe, we have history of all those countries, including Japan, that they have exported their capital in one way or another to make their economy a developed economy. So same is the policy that China is following, that they are exporting, exporting their capital, they are trying to develop the ties with African countries, and they are expanding their network over there. But this is not the aggressive sort, as you mentioned, that this is not an aggressive sort of imperialism. This is a soft imperialism, and in this soft imperialism, the countries who are actually inviting China, their people will also get some sort of benefits in the form of new infrastructure, which they will, do, they will have to develop over there, in the form of employment, and, and in the form of use of their resource space. So no doubt, it may be a sort of exploitative. I'm not, I'm not saying that it may not be exploitative, but along with that, the countries which are totally exploitative in nature and which are using the direct means, including military channels, and other means, this is a signal to those countries also that instead of using the direct mass exploitation, they have to change their methods also. And if they change their methods, it will definitely be beneficial for the masses that even though they are being exploited, but in a relative sense, their standard will improve up to some extent, I feel. Thank you. Uh, you are saying you for your answer. Here, uh, uh, we are having questions. I'm having two comments uh, before going to questions from uh, Professor Abhijit uh, and uh, Ashima, uh, saying uh, they are having like same, uh, same type of comments. They, uh, they are highlighting that uh, China is uh, having uh, internal uh, problems with uh, its uh, own citizen, like in Uyghur and uh, Muslim, you know, people in China. Uh, and uh, even it was their neighbor also, they do have uh, uh, like China, India, uh, troubles, uh, political uh, conflict. So what is your reflection about this? So China is uh, at the same time having in internal political uh, problems and external uh, political uh, so, so my point is that uh, when we are saying uh, that uh, China is uh, there is uh, internal problems in China, there are conflicts uh, with uh, other countries. China is in a conflict with other countries. I always recommend to the people that instead of following the state craft or state-sponsored intelligentsia of United States and their propaganda against China, instead of following the mainstream media that is trying to criticize the China, that one should try to think horizontally and one should try to apply his own power of reason instead of using the knowledge that is created in a by a particular ideology to criticize an other ideology right so this sort of this is not a new thing this sort of propaganda was there against the soviet union that that american statecraft has developed that sort of propaganda all over the world and same sort of things are going on so this is a sort of cold war that is going on right? and we are trying to pass our judgments on the basis of that. That is why I always refer that we should read the Chinese five-year plans. This is one. And we should read the recent reports by WTO, by, by World Bank, by WHO, 
by by UN United Nations, right? About China, and I also like to recommend that you should listen somewhere after 2010 what Amritya Sen was talking about China. So there is a complete shift in the ideas, particularly based upon the recent performance of China in human development. And if you see that we are always say that China is trying to capture some territories on borders. maybe which are near to india or maybe other parts of the world but that is if you see closely that is propagated by the mainstream media mainstream media which is very much a sponsored sort of media by the economic and political elites to divert the attention from those affairs which are more important that china is performing at a very at a very progressive rate in economic terms in 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 human development terms nobody is talking about that right so they have reduced poverty from 88% to 0.7% so these questions are very important they have only 6% of world's cultivable area and they are feeding around 25% of the world's population nobody is talking about that remarkable achievement nobody is talking about that they haven't slum population which is which is which is living in the cities population they have a decent accommodation they have a decent means of livelihood and nobody is talking about that so my thinking is that instead of going into the negative sides to the story we should also admire the positive sides of the story i am not in favor of china as far as their ideology is concerned as well as the method that they are following that there is no political democracy i am not saying that but i am just building a case against united states that china is china is going to be other power and without china if china is not going to rise then there will be a more imperialistic exploitation in the world and that exploitation will be more acute so for the masses and for the poor people and for the countries of global south it is a good sign if china is developing if china is rising so my point is only on the basis of this i am not going into the ideological clash i am not going that whether they are really really marxist or not that is not a my question my question is whether they are able to compete with the united states or not this time this is the fundamental question what they do after 20 years that is totally different question and they have proved that earlier when their people have criticized china that they are there is no internal democracy in china that there is no human development in china that if you see human development in china that they came out of that criticism who has praised china this time if you see the the the, the sars sars epidemic prior to that it was criticized by wto who who this time who has praised it so there are some changes which are going on in china and if you are talking about changes it takes time right to be a egalitarian society society and political bodies needs time right and with time if you see from 1950s to till date there is a lot of improvement in china right and their claim is that up to 2040 they will be highly democratic they will be highly egalitarian as per their plans right so being a third world citizen i am optimistic about it that if china is doing that or china is claiming that it is good for third world it is good for south at least that there is a power rising from asia and putting a challenge to europe and to the northern american countries that is a good sign so this is my argument is based upon only this yes uh here we are having lots of questions now i will ask you two questions first uh we are having questions from rakesh he is saying uh, can you elaborate uh, uh the deglobalization point on the deglobalization point and what it will be its consequences uh there is also uh, uh dr chaskaram he is asking you, uh, will you elaborate the chance uh, chances Uh, of the emergence of Keynesian economics, especially in the West. 
what is uh, what is second question second i was not able to like listen second uh, question he is asking about uh, elaborating on chances uh, of reemergence of the keynesian economics uh, in the especially in the west okay right thank you so the the first question that uh, you have uh, said that is about deglobalization right so deglobalization was already on the on the papers if you see brexit that was a sign of deglobalization if you see trade war between the united states and china that was also a sign of deglobalization and uh, if you see the rise of nationalist forces in europe and the popular politics in europe that is also a sign of deglobalization if you see the the the, the propaganda against immigrants all over the world in particularly in europe and northern american countries that is against a sign of deglobalization i am saying that it will accelerate there is one very important reason why it will accelerate if you see united states in us they have already followed an inward looking policy right so they are try they they have isolated united states they they have isolated itself from the from the world right so if if united states which which was a leading country in trade which was a leading financial international financial elite country if that country is isolating itself from the world then it is a very important sign of deglobalization and if you see the announcements by the by the by the by the political leaders in india also that we need a self dependent economy now right so this is other very important sign of deglobalization right so there are number of signs what are the implications of that that is more important so one implication is that if developed countries they deglobalize they they deglobalize like united states so united states if you see united states it is already running with shortage of labor if all manufacturing capital that they have invested all over the world will go back to united states they will face the problem of labor shortage in us so how they will overcome that shortage that i said there will be automation of production there will be a robotization of production this automation and robotization has very serious implication on working masses this robotization and automation will reduce the bargaining power of the workers in global north for more wages so that will be a very serious question for the workers in global north what will happen in global south so if capital will flight from here both manufacturing and financial it will leave these countries into the severe crisis because these countries they have already submitted their production base to the international capital the flight of international capital from these countries will create a serious problem of unemployment because in last 30 years new liberal capital has destroyed the production base of third world countries after destroying the production base of third world countries they established their hegemony now if there is deglobalization then it will result the mass dispossession in third world countries it will result the mass unemployment in these countries due to the capital flight that is already on its way so these are the consequences which are very serious for third world countries the second point is i was not able to get actually but the point i i but i understand that we are talking about keynesian policies that the keynesian policies or the rise of welfare state uh, during he is asking about uh, the reemergence of the keynesian policies like uh, as you know in times of crisis there is a return back to the keynesian prescription so that's why he is mentioning this thank you thank you i got it so reemergence of keynesian policies as i mentioned that keynesian policies were outcome of new deal during 1930s between frederick roosevelt and the economic uh, economic elites of united states and 
in England, in Western Europe particularly, that they should give up something in order to in order to avoid the resistance from the working people. Otherwise, they will face a very serious resistance from the working people and people will challenge the capitalism. So in order to save the capitalism, there was a new deal between political bodies and economic elites during the 30s. Right? So that new deal was product of rising power of working masses after First World War. That and the rise of particularly the rise of Soviet Union. The rise of Soviet Union has played an important role for the rise of welfare state in Western Europe and in the United States. But if we see the re-emergence of possibilities of re-emergence of Keynesianism, so there are not very, very bright possibilities of rise of Keynesianism at this conjuncture. And there is a reason for that. The reason is, first reason is, that political democracy is already in crisis all over the world due to the rise of authoritarian forces. Authoritarian forces do not like political democracy because authoritarian forces like to tightly control the political and social spheres in order to implement their agenda, whether agenda is ultra-nationalism, whether agenda is other sort of authoritarian targets, militarism, etc. Right? So this authoritarian state is not interested to enhance the welfare. They have other questions. Right? Earlier, the political democracy during the New Deal was based upon the political democracy, the welfareism, because there was some they want to save the liberal democracy. Now there is there is the political bodies are not ruled by the liberals. Political bodies are already controlled by the authoritarians. And authoritarians and the, 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 the global corporate and financial elite will make an alliance. The alliance will be that there will be an alliance. The alliance will be that economic elites will ensure the political power with these bodies. And in return, they will demand more deregulation of economic spheres. And that will certainly happen at a rapid rate, if not in Europe and United States, then definitely in third world countries. So this is a totally different sort of situation. And world will not return to the Keynesian regime as per its current juncture. Thank you. So we are having more questions. Uh, so Mary Han, uh, Mary Han, she's uh, asking uh, uh, two questions. Uh, first, uh, she's saying, uh, is it early to uh, forecast the future of the global order uh, in in matter of uh, the, uh, the future dominant power? Do you think is it early? And uh, secondly. Uh, she's saying, I assume that uh, China can read the situation well and knows the uh, available opportunity right now, but how can uh, China be able to attract different uh, countries, knowing that the United States' relations are uh, really deep with, uh, with the rest of the world, since now there is uh, like a war between China and U.S. So China how is going to, uh, to plan its future, knowing that USA is having deep relationship with the rest of the world. Um, same, on the delisting of Chinese films by USA. So I was able to listen the, <laughs> the first two. So let me answer first two. One is that is it early to forecast the new world order? And is it early to say that China will be the, the, the other uh, leading power in the global order? So I think China has 
proved its candidature even prior to covid 19 the outbreak of covid 19 so that candidature is that if we assume if we assume that manufacturing dominance or industrial dominance is an important indicator to become a developed country or to become a global power that china has attained after 1990 it has already passed united states in manufacturing production during 2000 and manufacturing production in china is more as compared to the united states this is one indicator that china has presented its candidature prior to even covid 19 the other thing is that china's candidature is not only strong because it is because united state is uh, is is at a, at a at a back foot there are other reasons also that japan cannot japan is not in a position to become a global power and there is a reason for that japan is facing a serious problem in demographic transition right and china has a sort of edge in case of that and if you see the chinese strategy in last 30 years what china is trying to do china and chinese state craft and intelligence yeah they sure. are putting best of their efforts to make japan their allies so if they become successful and japan the, the fundamental problem with japan is that they haven't workforce they have a technology and if china can ensure that and they come together then definitely the china's case will become more strong third is that is rise of russia re rise of russia right so russia and china's alliance in recent past and their efforts to come together to undermine the hegemony of united states we have witnessed recently that they have agreed to trade with their own currency so this can be a landmark landmark to break the hegemony of us dollars so this is very important that if these two countries come together one is great economic power other is great military power and as far as surface area of the world is concerned if they come together then definitely china's leadership will become more strong so i think this is just yes, we can say that this is early but i also feel that this covid 19 i said it can be a nodal point where china will definitely rise so the other point that you have said that is china can china able to attract different countries uh, like so so the thing is that middle east already there are some countries like iran and other countries they are making lines with the china they like to make alliance with china instead of united states because united states is naturally against uh, iran right and turkey is naturally against uh, united states so turkey and uh, uh, iran will come together on other hand they have pakistan that that is uh, that they have a, a close allies and they have uh, china is also trying to put efforts to bring india close to them although united states and their statecraft is putting continuous effort to retain india in their club right so because they know that if india join china then western europe united states will lose its hegemony for sure so there is only one key country that is left that is india so now it is india's state craft and diplomacy how they gauge the future so if they gauge a positive and equitable future and if they go with china instead of united states then the picture of the world order will be totally different but current scenario says or shows that india is not going to go with china and i feel that if they will not go with china then they will be in a losing side thank you yes we are having a few questions if you still have time so uh, 
uh, that uh, question that you didn't hear, it is uh, uh, from uh, Magish Dandi. He's saying, what are your views on delisting of Chinese firms by USA? Views, views on? Delisting, delisting Chinese firms. So, I haven't uh, idea about that. I haven't listened about it. So, I am sorry about that. If somebody other can answer this question, then it could be better because I haven't heard about it. Okay, so let's skip this one. Uh, here, uh, we are having a technical development increase with uh, uh, increase of globalization to exploit the uh, world resources, but now uh, it is uh, possible to uh, increase artificial intelligence with the uh, globalization. So uh, I think he's the, and then uh, yeah, I, we are having one uh, important question asking about uh, uh, the question on uh, the credibility of uh, World Health Organization. What do you think about uh, the credibility of World Health uh, Organization and uh, the war now between USA and uh, and China in that matter? Uh, also, there is. Uh, I will tell you the rest of the question, and uh, you pick uh, the one that you uh, would like to answer. Uh, we are having one question also is asking about uh, climate uh, crisis. The effects of the, uh, the, this pandemic on the climate crisis. Another question uh, of Marianne, she is saying about will the strong countries uh, like USA and the EU make it easy for China to just lead the world without obstacles or uh, any wars? Um, uh, Reina is saying, uh, is asking to elaborate on de globalization. Uh, is how deglobalization will lead to the uh, capitalism as we, we as everyone knows uh, capitalism increased with globalization globalization china is one of the example um, that's all these are the, the rest of like comments and uh, questions thank you thank you very much so i will to justify uh, all these one is uh, the first question is w2 and it's uh, the question on its credibility so as i mentioned earlier that uh, this is all about that you apply your own power of reason instead of uh, uh, perceiving the knowledge that is created by the state intelligence here so the knowledge which is there that is nowadays whatever we are listening on mainstream media in India and mainstream media in the United States, that knowledge is a sponsored knowledge. Right. You apply your own power of reason. That WHO's creditability is in a question because WHO has praised China this time. Its creditability was not in question in the last 50 years. When it has criticized China, it was not problem of creditability. When it has praised other countries, there was no problem of creditability. Now the problem of creditability just came because WHO has praised China, right? So who are who, pe who are those people who are talking about the creditability of WTO? Largely, the mainstream media of United States is talking about that. The trained statecraft of US is talking about that their intelligence is talking about that and same sort of information we are perceiving through the mainstream media of india and we know the current state situation of india's media it is totally corporate sponsor it is totally meeting the objectives of economic and political bodies so my thing is that they are not going to give you the true picture. If you really want to see the true picture, then you have to put your own independent efforts. Try to apply your own power of reason on first-hand resources. Either visit some of or try to find out some of the resources on 
WTO's website, on UN website, on other websites, on read the official documents of China, right? read the official documents of other countries, then pass this judgment and your judgment will definitely be better than the judgment of the sponsored statecraft. So this is a fundamental problem that there is nothing to, it, is, it, has, it has nothing to do with the credibility. China has performed well and we should appreciate that. Right. So this is one. The, the second is that uh, um, the climate change and pandemic. Uh, so I think that this is a great opportunity for those activists and those people who were concerned with ecology. Great opportunity in the sense that there are possibilities for those countries where political democracy is a in a functioning mode. That if these bodies, which are activist bodies, put more pressure through this pandemic to make their ecology or their growth more environmental sustainable in future, then it can definitely contribute better to tackle the ecological crisis. But how intelligently and you can fuse the current pandemic with the climate crisis, that can play an important role for this. So you have to fuse, as I said, you have to fuse all the issues to make a collective issue in order to re-establish the functioning democracy. So the tragedy of the social movements were in the past that we had gender movement, very good gender movement, but that was an isolated movement totally. We had climate movements that has nothing to do with gender movement. We had movements about uh, uh, so the, the social sector spending, education and health that has nothing to do with climate as well as with uh, as well as with health. Um, there, there were other movements also, gay right movements in West that has nothing to do with other movements. Now this is the time that all these movements should come together with a common agenda to build an egalitarian socio-economic system. And this is an opportunity to build a society which can be more ecological sustainable. So one thing about ecology that I would like to say, if there is deglobalization, then there will be relatively, relatively less ecological degradation. Because if capital will fly to their home countries, and there are a lot of barriers in, in Western countries as well as in North America as far as environment is concerned. So they have to reduce the G, uh, CO2 effect. CO2, carbon emission in, in those countries. And if capital will fight from these countries, here the exploitation of domestic resources will also fall. But it will come with a cost. The other point is that, so can strong countries allow to allow China to become a global power? So definitely nobody likes to lose the hegemony. Right? So uh, Britain has submitted its hegemonic status to the United States during Second World War, when they entered into the severe crisis. Then they submitted their hegemony to the United States, and the United States has took the responsibility to be the global hegemonic power. And the United States has carried it. But if you see, to, to become a global power, and with global power, there are a number of responsibilities which come. So U.S. is a global power, but U.S. has maintained its global power at a huge cost. So how many people or soldiers of United States have died all over the world? How much money they have invested in military and armament? Right? How much resources they have devoted to these crises? Right? So those so us will not waste uh you will has will, will not think about to to withdraw from a hegemonic power because they have invested a lot to be a hegemonic power but definitely strong countries particularly who are followers of capitalism or a liberal democratic institutions they will go with united states 
and it is very difficult for china to rise because china hasn't that sort of allies which united states have so most of the countries in that club are rich countries most of the countries that which, which are going to join china those are not equivalently rich countries but they have resources like african countries so it is difficult for china i agree with this but power comes with cost and china should be ready to bear that cost then you can become a possible global power the other is about deglobalization we already discussed this idea i think that deglobalization the one point that i would like to discuss that deglobalization and its implications for capitalism so one thing that is going to happen with this deglobalization that if capitalism will sustain without globalization and if there is no globalization what will happen that world will go back to an order which was there prior to 1870 the idea to capture the world market it becomes quite popular during 1870s and the result was first world war, war was was outcome of that so deglobalization and nationalism if it will rise then capitalism will become internal but if capitalism is going to be going to be inward then it is inevitably a crisis because capitalism cannot sustain without external market if you read its history capitalism cannot sustain without external market so if capitalism is going to be a nationalist it is it's it is itself a signal to a very serious crisis of capitalism and capitalism is going to enter into that so this deglobalization is not going to be a permanent policy for sure it may be a deglobalization may be a this is a pop, part of popular politics capitalism do not want to be a controlled system it want it always wants to be a global system as rosa luxemburg has pointed out that capitalism like to be a global system right so if you close it into the national boundaries these its contradictions will become more severe so in that context it is very important to gauge the capitalism with the national character it cannot sustain so this is a very serious challenge for capitalism itself thank you so uh, i think we uh, we are done with all our questions for today and uh, i would like uh, uh, to thank you dr paramjit singh for your uh, enlightening uh, and insightful uh, presentation on covid-19 pandemic crisis uh, and the new uh, that debate on the new economic and political order so we uh, we are really appreciating uh, having this critical uh, concept to be uh, clarified to our participant today so uh, please uh, uh, have a small token of our appreciation here in the general center for the global south uh, for uh, your uh, for accepting our invitation to participate so please accept our sincere thanks and thank you for uh, everyone who has attended today and who, for everyone who has actively participate in this uh, uh, webinar and we look forward for uh, hosting you in future webinar thank you thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for these very interesting questions and uh, uh, this uh, interesting talk I, i i really appreciate it thank you very much thank you stay safe and uh, uh, bye Bye. Thank you good goodbye thank